Hello Book 2. We're going to continue with my library tour here. We're just working our way up this Joe original bookcase. And uh, this one was made to order like all of my Joe originals were. And this one I chose to be uh, narrow and tall. So it fits a hardcover book in with no extra shelf space. There's no lip to put stuff on. But there's an inch or two of space above to put books laterally, and so we have crosswise books on every shelf of this bookcase. So let's deal with the crosswise books first. Uh, the first one we have is this beautiful thing, the Barnes Noble Leatherbound Edition of Dune. Uh, when they, when Barnes Noble Leatherbound Editions do uh, have a good one, they have a really, really good one. This is a really, really good one. This is just look at those ornithopters. This is just lovely, absolutely lovely. With the, the gilt pages and the, the built-in bookmark and the, the custom covers all the way around, the custom artwork all the way around. I'm not always a fan of Barnes & Noble leather-bound editions. Some of them seem a little dull to me, a little unadventurous, but this one, hoo-hoo. <laughs> so, uh, so I had to have it. Dune's one of my favorite novels, so I have, well, we've already encountered, right? I, I have a few editions of Dune. Uh, the one edition that I don't have that I dearly, dearly covet is the Folio Society edition of Dune. I, I don't usually want the Folio Society edition of anything because I'm hard on my books. I'm the first one to admit that. So having a really nice, fine edition would be asking for trouble. But the Folio Society edition of Dune is so nice. It's just so nice. And I've heard from a lot of you that Folio Society editions are really indestructible. They're really, really tough. So I know what I would do if I ever find that, if it gets, if it makes its way to the Brattle Bookshop, I know what I will do uh, if I ever find it. I will take it out of its slipcase box, because that's where I'm asking for trouble. And I will just put the box in the draw somewhere and never think of it again, and I will just use the book. Uh, but I, I, haven't, I haven't ever gone online to look at how much it costs, whether or not there's any really cheap deal that I could find on eBay or anything like that. I'll come across it. It's, it's an edition of Dune that I really, really want. But otherwise, I have plenty of, I have plenty of others. Uh, so the last of the Crosswise books is a little hardcover. This is Walter Pater's The Renaissance, his little history of the Italian Renaissance. This is a great book. This was uh, discarded from the Bill Ricca Library. <laughs> uh, I don't know what it's doing in here. It's it's a great work of history, but it, it's, it belongs with my history books to make room. Not in this case much room, but still. Um, then we move on to the books on the shelf itself. We have this thing here. This is the Country House Guide. I've mentioned before on this channel, that those of you who are new to the channel, maybe maybe you don't know, that I have a sweet tooth for English country houses. I've been in almost all of them. I've known a lot of people who own them. And I find them fascinating anyway. I just think they're an amazing little micro phenomenon in architectural and social history. And uh, they are the subject of innumerable guidebooks. This is a great one. It has color and black and white photos, floor plans, histories, all that sort of thing. Uh, so I was happy to find it. I, I should have all my country house books together, but I do not. <laughs> then we have a comparatively recent book. Uh, when did you come out? Uh, 2021. Yes, this is by Daniel Ogden. This is The Werewolf and the Ancient World. Uh, gotta love the Ogden family. <laughs> this is not a long thing at all, but it is a study of werewolf lore in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, to the extent that we know what they thought of such things. Uh, then we have two copies of the same thing. Isn't that right? Are these two copies of the same thing? Uh, oh, no. No, they're not. They're two, they're two copies of the same thing, but two different editions of Frankenstein. So, I've mentioned, I've mentioned before that slowly but surely, canonical classics, uh, I very much include Dune, <laughs> are, are slowly creeping to fill this whole room. They're slowly edging out the more eclectic other books that are in here. Uh, they have their own bookcase that has that is only them, but I could easily make two more bookcases just with canonical classics, and I mean to do that. I mean to rearrange things so that that happens. Uh, and these two are both editions of Frankenstein. I have, uh, this is illustrated by Barry Moser. So there you've got a cover. Let me get you another illustration here so that you, you know what we're talking about. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> this is all, uh, all warped and and uh, stressed and distressed and all kinds of things. I think I found this very cheaply and grabbed it and reinforced it just a bit. And then another edition of Frankenstein. This is Leonard Wolf, The Essential Frankenstein. We already saw his Essential Dracula a couple of times, or at least once. I think that was last time, right? Yeah, his Essential, his essential Dracula. Uh, 
and this is the same thing as the essential Dracula. It's not quite as amusing, but it's really, really good. Where he takes the text and just hugely annotates it. Just enormously. Right? It writes about every single little detail of this book. It's really, really fun. He's a really fun annotator. Okay, then we have, <laughs> uh, we have a romance novel. A uh, hardcover romance novel. There's only one of those in this room, as far as I know. This is uh, When Passion Rules by Joanna Lindsay. And I would recognize that posterior. Anyway, that is Paul Marin without his shirt on <laughs> and with a ceremonial guard uniform. And believe it or not, those of you who are doing Roger's Cheap Old Book Club, this is Ruritanian fiction. This is a, a, a modern day romance about a small pocket kingdom in Europe and it's the, the trials and tribulations of its heir <laughs> and the dashing guardsman in this particular case. I wrote about this book somewhere along the line, somewhere. I think for either Open Letters Weekly or Steve Reads. I wrote about this book and about Ruritanian fiction. I will do my best to find that material. What I really need is an archivist who's willing to work for Wine and Calzones, who was willing to go to just scour the internet and put everything from the old Steve Reads, my, my Steve Reads literary blog, put it under the Steve Reads banner on stevedonahue.com. Rescue it. Restore all the links. Restore all the images. I really need somebody to do that. I'm clearly not going to do that. <laughs> but I did write about it. I'll try to find it. And then we have another a great historical novel. This is Julian by Gore Vidal. The classic original hardcover, which I reinforced in my old way. The next time I see this with a dust jacket in hardcover, I will grab it. I will get rid of this. And I will reinforce it with a library dust jacket the way a normal person should. But I, I uh, this is fine for me. It makes this thing waterproof and indestructible. And this is the Gore Vidal's novel about Julian the Apostate, about the Roman emperor who tried to restore the old gods, tried to turn back the clock on the advance of Christianity. Uh, I really like it. I reread it when I found this book, uh, when I found this edition. I also like the mass market paperback, which I have not found in quite some time. Uh, the mass market paperback that was the original version that I read this in, I ignored it when it was out in hardcover when it first came out. I read the mass market paperback because it was everywhere and because it had original artwork. And right in the center of the cover was a young man in a kind of quasi-Roman, you know, outfit. <laughs> and I noticed the cover because the young man is fairly good looking, but he's also clean shaven. And the cover illustration, of course, had to be done by someone who had no idea who Julian the Prostate was, much less anything that he'd written himself. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I, sooner or later I will find that Mass Market Payback. It will crop up at the brow. And in the meantime, I will also find uh, another hardcover of this that I can reinforce correctly. Uh, oh, okay. Then we have Justin Peters' book, The Idealist. Oh, my. Okay. Yeah, full of uh, full of clipped reviews. Just full. This is Aaron Schwartz and the Rise of Free Culture on the Internet. This is Justin Peters' book on Aaron Schwartz. Uh, a net an internet visionary, a young internet visionary, uh, who was faced with what he viewed as an unacceptable future and killed himself rather than face it. Or he'd be alive today. He wouldn't even be an old man today. He wouldn't. He'd be. He wouldn't even be in the middle age now. Uh, a pretty distressing subject. Every once in a while, one gets away. Uh, and uh, angering still to this day. Uh, uh, Aaron Schwartz was guilty of something he needed if you're guilty of something if you, if you knowingly <sighs> and also the young woman who was living with him knew perfectly well <laughs> the danger of leaving him alone anyway anyway this is not a biography this is this is much more interesting than that this is uh i wonder if it has pictures of aaron i wonder if it does probably it does not but uh but the reviews all did to stress his youth um, it's one of many books that I have about Aaron Schwartz. I think all of them are probably in this room, so we'll be getting to them uh, in due time. Uh, then we have a classic. This is a, this is a classic. It's got a little bit of junk in it. We don't want that. Let's get this out of here. Uh, yeah, that's nothing at all. This is a terrific book. This is by Alan Weissman, and it is The World Without Us. And it starts with a thought experiment, which is what happens if humans disappeared overnight, all of them at once. What if they all disappeared simultaneously? What would happen to the world? And it's utterly fascinating. The author is so good at pursuing this hypothetical. You'll just find it 
engrossing reading, figuring out what happens in the short term and then in the slightly longer term and then in the very long term, what happens to the earth? What happens to things like uh, nuclear reactors that need human activity in order to stop them from going critical? What happens to nuclear submarines that need human activity to stop them from going critical in the middle of the ocean? Uh, what happens to the buildings and the cities and whatnot, you'll come away from this with all sorts of big thoughts and all sorts of little, hey, did you know, moments that are just so fascinating. Like, for instance, one of the one of the things that Weissman de deals with in his book right away, and I loved it, uh, is the, the stereotypical myth that if, if the world were to be destroyed, cockroaches would still live. They'd be everywhere because they're so hardy. Uh, Weissman points out that cockroaches are a tropical species, and that if they didn't have the artificial heating that humans provide in all the cities in the Northeast, for instance, or in the northern part of the country, they wouldn't be there. <laughs> and if that heating failed, they would all die or migrate. Uh, but it goes on at great length on a whole bunch of other things. It is such a good book. I know a lot has been spun off from it in terms of TV series or the author wrote another book, but uh, this original is well worth your time to read. Uh, okay, all right, great. Fantastic. This next one is a novel. This is a novel by H.F. Saint. This is called Memoirs of an Invisible Man. This is a Book of the Month Club trade edition, I think. Uh, but this is about a man who uh, just idly, to pass the afternoon and please a demanding girlfriend, goes to a scientific exhibition. And it goes wrong. And a huge crater appears in the Earth. But it's not really a crater. It's not really a crater. It's the bottom bolus of a circular explosion that made everything in that perimeter invisible. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a crater because you can walk out along the top of it. It's just that everything below it is invisible. And our main character is caught in that explosion and becomes invisible. Uh, so unlike H.G. Wells' Invisible Man, he's not doing it intentionally. But also unlike H.G. Wells' Invisible Man, he has a brain in his head. He tries to figure out, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I don't want to be taken captive by the U.S. military and experimented upon. I want my freedom. I want to be able to live as a person until I can figure out how to cure myself. So what do I do? And that what do I do is very practical. It extends to, how do I drive back home? <laughs> how do I do that? My car was not affected, but how can I walk across the campus of this institution, even with EMTs and police, you know, directly involved, concentrating on something else? How is an empty suit of clothes supposed to walk across the campus to the car? And then what do I do in the car? So I'm driving, but no one's at the wheel. There are going to be people right next to me in traffic. What are they going to think? <laughs> and how do I get back into my apartment? Et cetera, et cetera. And it goes on from there because after after a very brief time, he becomes hunted. And there he finds that invisibility is as much a hand a hindrance as a help. It's just just wonderful. It it takes all the premises of the H. G. Wells books and just works them in a way that never occurred to Wells to do. And all sorts of ways. So and Boston features prominently in the book. It's, it's just a tremendous, tremendous read. Uh, it was made into a very, very bad movie with Chevy Chase. I guess that's kind of a redundancy. Uh, but there was also a mass market paperback, which again I would love to find. I, I read this first in that mass market paperback. I'd love to find it. I'm sure that I will. It used to have a wide print run. Uh, okay, then we have another classic. I have not reinforced this with clear plastic packing tape, so I will put a book cover over this. In fact, I'll set it aside to do it now. Uh, this is great. It is, I consider, canonical, so it belongs in that ever-growing bookcase. This is the short stories of Frank O'Connor, one of the great short story writers in the English language. Uh, and this has all of the major ones. Just, he's an amazing figure. This book is more typically seen, I believe, that the print run of the trade paperback that showed a, an old an old Irish pub on the cover, a white, a white spine with an old Irish pub on the cover. I believe that print run is far more common than this hardcover, but I go back to Frank O'Connor all the time. I think his stories are just amazingly good. I'm going to set this aside in order to reinforce it correctly. I'll put a, a covering over it, a dust jacket over it. Uh, okay, then we have, uh, this is Bern Heinrich. He's shown up on this channel before. Uh, he wrote Ravens in Winter, which we saw in this, uh, in this tour. And this is his book, One Man's Owl, where he talks about uh, an owl that he befriends and knows, but also about owls just in general, all of his illustrations there. Just a great, I, I, I'm pretty sure that it's obvious from this point that I have a thing for owls. I have a real soft spot for them. 
and uh, I love reading about them. And I love reading about uh, their, their other, two of his best friends. Uh, I, I love reading about them too. I love, there's a whole little subgenre of books about people who become intimate with owls. They've gotten to know them really well, invite them into their homes. And I love those books, just love them. Uh, and then we'll finish up with this great big thing. This is the big book of science fiction by Anne and Jeff Vandermeer in the, in the, uh, the vintage big book series. But this, the, in that vintage big book series, uh, some are better than others. This is one of the best ones they ever did. And Jeff and Anne Vandermeer might not write the kind of science fiction that I really like to read, but boy, oh boy, are they great editors. Just fantastic. This has everything. A representative, a representation of pretty much everything that I would want. If not the exact stories, because no anthology is going to do that. Still, what a science fiction anthology. What an amazing science fiction anthology. Uh, it was a mainstay of New World's November for me. And I think it will be again. The, the great thing about a really good anthology is that you want to keep revisiting it. Even though you've already read everything that's in it, you still want to keep going. Uh, so I will definitely do that. <laughs> I will definitely do that. Uh, and that... That is it. I have a repair job to do, but other than that, that is it for this shelf. So we're going to move on. Next time, we'll do one shelf up. We'll just keep going all the way to the top. Uh, so I'll wrap this up for now, and I'll see you then. Thank you, BookTube.